The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. I'm Ken Leon, Research Director at CFRA, and thank you for joining us today in our series, The Road to Recovery. And, and today for the healthcare sector, top of mind is speaking about COVID-19 therapies and investing in the medical landscape. With me today is Kevin Wang, uh, Industry Analyst for Healthcare, and also Sel Hardy, Healthcare Analyst as well. Uh, we're really excited uh, to talk about COVID therapies and also the ripple effect uh, to what it's doing to medical procedures and, and outpatient activity. Uh, so we're definitely going to drill down into those areas. But before we do that, uh, and looking at today's agenda, um, we will cover uh, first the COVID-19 treatments and vaccines. Just look at medical industry volumes and, and how top of mind this is. And then uh, for investments besides pharmaceutical, uh, we'll also focus on medical device uh, from Kevin and managed care uh, from Cell again. Uh, but first, let's talk a little bit about CFRA. And CFRA uh, is a world leader in terms of fundamental research. Uh, we're one of the largest independent research firms. We, we have a long history of innovation and growth. Uh, some key milestones uh, was back in October 2016 uh, when CFRA acquired the S&P Equity and Fund Research Practice. Another big opportunity uh, a year ago was the acquisition of First Bridge Data, uh, which drove us to be uh, a leader in terms of ETF data and analytics. Next slide. So the engine of our fundamental research uh, gets distilled out to our customers. Uh, as you can see the chart here from the markets or market commentary. Uh, Sam Stolvo, our chief investment strategist, uh, speaks to uh, his weekly commentary. He's a world leader in terms of sector insights and also portfolio views. Um, the teamwork that we have, you know, in terms of the top-down macro uh, to our sector and industry research, um, we cover uh, over 1,500 qualitative stocks. Uh, but our analysts are really unique in that uh, for our customers, they are kind of threading that to what are the most attractive industries and then blending our bottom up <clears throat> with our top down research uh, from Sam and the Investment Policy Committee, uh, where we're over or underweighting sectors or market weight. Uh, ETF and mutual fund research, um, we have a dynamic platform led by Todd Rosenbluff, our head of uh, research here, and uh, our methodology enables our investors uh, to look forward in terms of the fundamental drivers that we see uh, besides the historical, and that's a best-in-class position. Um, mostly uh, related to single company research is the ability of our fundamental analysts like Cell and Kevin uh, to partner with our forensic analysts, world-class um, skill sets and using diagnostics uh, to, to look at risk mitigation. Uh, and this has been uh, terrific in terms of identifying opportunities or where there are risks uh, in terms of our recommendations. And then what I'm most proud of on the fundamental research team is our thematic research, uh, which enables us to share with you every week uh, and during the week, but every week we're putting out Monday uh, at least three thematic reports on industries or key profiles. For example, Kevin uh, on his launch of Moderna, and he'll be talking about that today, uh, was a fantastic thematic research, research report uh, a month ago. Next slide. So all this great research really has to be proven in terms of our ability to recommend and show performance for you, our customers. And you can see here for firms covering more than 900 stocks uh, that we uh, were ranked number one on the basis of combined buys and sells. Uh, this really relates to our objectivity and also our independence 
Um, and we feel that making the right call for our customers is most important. And as you can see on the next slide, please, we don't have any conflicts. We are independent. It's exciting to be at a firm where 100% of our capital is invested in fundamental research and our ability to continue to refine our platform, whether it's Market Scope Advisor, the data and analytics, as I refer to ETF, um, the methodologies that you can see on our website. It, it's just an exciting place to be. We don't do asset management or investment banking. We are not a broker dealer. We're really here to serve you. Uh, and other firms may claim to be independent, but of course, not in the sense that we are. Next slide, please. So with that, let's get into our presentation and turn it over to Cell uh, to cover the COVID-19 treatments and vaccines. Good morning, Cell. Good morning. So where are we today with COVID-19? Uh, globally, as of today, we have more than 23 million of COVID-19 cases. In the US, the number is nearing 6 million and we have close to 180,000 deaths. Unfortunately, the curve has not flattened yet, as you can see uh, from the graph, but we are in a much better position compared to the peak we saw in mid-July, where the daily number of new cases was at 71,000. As of August 24th, uh, more than uh, 40,000 daily new cases uh, were announced, and the last seven days average was around 43,000. That said, there's a large number of pharma and biopharma companies working on solutions. Based on Milken Institute's data, currently there are 316 treatments and around 200 vaccines against COVID-19 that are being developed globally. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk a little bit more about the COVID-19 landscape. Uh, of the 200 vaccines that are being currently developed, 32 of them are in human trials, which means that they are either in phase one, phase two, or phase three clinical studies. Let me just briefly explain what happens in each clinical trial. In clinical trial phase one, scientists give the vaccine to, sm to a small number of people, uh, between 20 to eight volunteers, and here they test the safety and the dosage to confirm that the vaccine really works to stimulate the immune system. Once this phase is successful, they move to phase two, where this time the vaccine is administered to hundreds of people split into different age groups, such as children and elderly. Uh, here, scientists again want to test how the vaccine reacts with each group and whether, if it's, whether it's efficient or not. Once this uh, phase is also concluded successfully, uh, scientists move to phase three, where this time the vaccine is administ administered to thousands of people in different countries. And here, scientists wait to see how many people become infected. Then they compare the results with volunteers who received a placebo to see whether the vaccine provides immunity against COVID-19 or not. Once scientists conclude that this phase is successful, then the vaccine candidate goes to the regulatory approval process, which is conducted by the FDA in the United States. Now, it's important to note that the FDA announced in June that for a COVID-19 vaccine to be effective, it has to protect at least 50% of the vaccinated people. That means if 100 people are vaccinated, at least 50% has to have immunity against the virus. Currently, we have two vaccines that have been approved. Uh, one in Russia and one in China. Uh, the Chinese company CanSino Biologics developed a vaccine with the Chinese military and they completed phase one and two. The phase three is currently underway, but the vaccine has been authorized for use for the Chinese military. Uh, the other vaccine was approved in Russia in the beginning of August. It was developed by the Ministry of Health Clinical trial phase one was conducted, but the large-scale testing is set to start. Uh, nonetheless, the vaccine will start being used for people at high risk. Next, next slide, please. With two approved vaccines and many in late-stage trials, many are wondering what might a vaccination campaign look like? And the first thing we want to stress is that 
vaccines are no panacea. Even with multiple vaccines approved, it's unlikely that we're going to be able to return quickly to a pre-pandemic world. As we saw with the COVID-19 testing effort, a lot of complications and difficulties can arise in the process of trying to distribute certain healthcare efforts across a whole nation, across the world. And we think that it will certainly be difficult for COVID-19 vaccine as well, even with US government efforts, such as Operation Warp Speed. This is an initiative to deliver over 300 million courses of therapy of a COVID-19 vaccine over the first six months of 2021. We think that this is a little aggressive, but we do think that most wanting Americans will be vaccinated by the end of 2021. One of our biggest concerns with the distribution of a vaccine is that many people will be reluctant at first to take the first available vaccines. In fact, less than 50% of adults aged 19 to 64 get a flu shot every year. So we think that there's a lot of reason for this. For one, there's pressure to rapidly distribute and develop a vaccine, which could undermine people's confidence in the integrity of the process. On top of that, there's also historical precedent for anti-vaccination attitudes. For example, the 1955 Cutter incident, where a polio vaccine was manufactured by a company that had poor manufacturing oversight and ended up causing polio in the people who took the vaccine. On top of that, there are many crucial uncertainties that remain. One of the main ones being the length of immunity. It's unclear how long of a time frame of immunity is conferred by the vaccines that are approved. If it's a short period, that means people will need to be constantly revaccinated in order to have immunity and that would present a lot of problems on its own. Next slide. So which companies are leading the COVID-19 vaccine development? Within our US healthcare coverage, we think four companies are well positioned. These companies are Johnson & Johnson, Merck, Moderna, and Pfizer. As this is a large scale effort, we are seeing a broad range of collaborations as these leading vaccine candidates are being planned to be ready in late 2020 and into 2021. And because this is an accelerated process at an unprecedented speed, certain steps overlap and certain phases are jointly conducted. As you can see in Johnson & Johnson's example, currently the company is conducting combined phase one and two clinical trial. It's a collaboration with Beth Israel Medical Center. Uh, Merck is working on two vaccine candidates and both are in phase one clinical trials. The first collaboration is with Temis and Institut Pasteur. Uh, Temis is an Austrian vaccine developer that Merck acquired in May this year. Uh, and Merck and Themis has a broad pipeline of vaccine candidates and immunotherapies. Institut Pasteur is a leading French nonprofit organization specialized in vaccine development. The other partnership that Merck has is with the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, which is a global nonprofit working on vaccine developments. Moderna is one of the fast movers and is currently in phase three clinical trials. Moderna is also in collaboration with the Swiss contract manufacturer Lonza, as it plans to make tens of millions of doses a month by the end of 2020 and eventually as much as 100 million doses a month by 2021. Pfizer was also one of the fast movers. It's in collaboration with the German biotech company BioNTech, and they are now in combined phase two and three clinical trials. Uh, last week, early data was released and it pointed out the positive results in terms of immunogenicity, uh, which showed that the desired immune response response was attained and the vaccine was safe. Uh, Pfizer now expect to go for regulatory review as early as October and manufacture globally up to 100 million doses by the end of 2020. Next slide, please. So how do vaccines work? Uh, there are actually two main platforms that researchers are using to develop a COVID-19 vaccine the traditional platform and the novel mRNA-based platform. They both have the same goal, which is to teach the immune system how to recognize and block the COVID-19 virus. The traditional vaccine platform introduces a small or inactive form of the virus to stimulate the immune system. We think both Johnson & Johnson and Merck are 
placed in the race with their traditional vaccine candidates. Johnson & Johnson is working on a non-replicating viral vector technology uh, where a disabled version of the common cold virus, or more specifically the adenovirus, is combined with the gene from the COVID-19 surface protein. Uh, Merck's uh, two candidates uh, both use the replicating viral vector technology. This is a proven technology that Merck has been using for decades, to which a COVID-19 protein or RNA will be added. One candidate is based on Merck's measles vaccine platform, and the other one uses the platform of Merck's Ebola vaccine. Next slide, please. mRNA vaccines are a newer technology that have never been approved before by the FDA. And they may have their breakout moments this year or next year with, because of the pandemic. Currently, two of the leading vaccine candidates are mRNA-based, Pfizer and BioNTech's, BioNTech's, and also Moderna's. One of the main reasons that mRNA vaccines hold a lot of promise is because unlike the other vaccine technologies that Sal just mentioned, they don't require cell in the process, cells in the process of production. And that, instead, they use the recipient's body to produce the desired proteins, which lowers the complexity, cost, and risk of vaccine production. In the diagram below, we have an illustration of how Moderna's vaccine is intended to work. In the first Im image, we have a mRNA, which is designed by Moderna. That mRNA is coded to induce the human cell to produce certain proteins. In the second diagram image, we show an example of it, where viral proteins are being produced by the cells. And these viral proteins themselves cannot cause the virus. In the case of COVID-19, the goal is to produce COVID-19 viral proteins so that in the last image, the body can recognize the viral proteins and develop the appropriate defenses and immune response to address it in, the, in future cases if people get infected. Next slide. The US government made two large scale agreements, uh, one with Johnson & Johnson and one with Pfizer to make large scale purchases of the COVID-19 vaccine once it's available. Uh, the first deal was made late July with Pfizer and the US government agreed to pay 1.95 billion for 100 million doses. This price is a single vaccine dose at $19.50. The second agreement was made with Johnson & Johnson early August, uh, and the US government agreed to pay 1 billion for 100 million doses. This price is a single vaccine dose at $10. Earlier, Johnson & Johnson had an award from the U.S. government in the amount of $456 million. So if we add this award to the total amount, then the price of a single vaccine dose will come at $14.50. However, we can conclude that Johnson & Johnson's vaccine was priced cheaper, whether priced at $10 or $14.50, compared to a dose of the Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide, please. So are COVID-19 vaccines financial implications reflected in share prices? We think not necessarily. For the exception of Moderna, whose share price skyrocketed since March, as you can see from the graph. We see upward movements in stock prices with positive news around cl clinical studies driving share prices, uh, which is the case for Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, and Merck. And we expect to see uh, this going forward. However, we think the potential boost from the massive scale vaccine sales are not incorporated in valuations yet. We think uh, there are two reasons to that. One, the regulatory approval has not been granted yet. And second, there are uncertainties about when exactly the vaccine will be ready and how frequently it will need to be administered. Next slide, please. So here we want to elaborate a little bit more on the revenue opportunities from the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, the U.S. government uh, announced uh, with the J&J deal that it may purchase an additional 200 million doses. Although the financial terms were not disclosed for the second agreement, if you assume $10 price per dose, if you want to be conservative and not use the $14.50 per dose, it would value the agreement at 2 billion. So for 2021, 
the top line revenue will increase by 2%. We think for 2020, the revenue contribution from the US agreement will be minimal for Johnson & Johnson between 1.2 or 2%. But we think there might be additional agreements with other governments or other, there might be other possibilities, especially in 2021. We want to highlight that Johnson & Johnson announced that the vaccine will be provided at a non-profit basis. So we do not expect any impact on the bottom line profitability. Other companies did not make such announcements. Therefore, it's important to see whether other companies will follow Johnson & Johnson's example. Ultimately, Johnson & Johnson might also provide the vaccine at a non-profit basis in the beginning, but may turn it to a profit project later on. Moving on to Pfizer, for Pfizer, we think the real revenue opportunity will be in 2021. We think uh, in 2020, just taking into account the agreement with the US government, the revenue contribution for the top line will be around 4%. But for 2021, Pfizer also has a potential uh, agreement with the US government, which announced it can acquire up to 500 additional 500 million additional doses. In addition to that, Pfizer also reached an agreement with the Japanese government to provide 120 million doses, and another one with the Canadian government for 100 million doses. For those two agreements, the financial terms were not disclosed, but assuming $19.50 per dose, we valued the Japanese government's deal at $2.3 billion and the agreement with the Canadian government at another $2 billion. So if we add up, add up all of these, this could create an additional $14 billion opportunity for Pfizer and an increase in the top line revenue for 2021 by 26%. In addition, Pfizer is in talks with the European Union for a similar deal. So we might expect a similar deal with 100 million doses at least. Next slide, please. So now let's move on to leading COVID-19 treatments. We think Merck, Johnson & Johnson, Eli Lilly, and Regeneron are the leading companies working on COVID-19 treatments. Merck has been working on, working on antiviral COVID-19 treatment, which is a collaboration with Ridgeback Biologics. This treatment is now in phase two clinical trials. Johnson & Johnson is working on several therapies in collaboration with the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. And Eli Lilly has been working on the rheumatoid arthritis medicine, which has been used to treat patients hospitalized with COVID-19. Now these clinical studies are in trial phase three. In addition, Eli Lilly is working on a promising COVID-19 antibody treatment. Now we think antibody treatments are going to be more effective. Scientists think that they could provide immunity and strongly treat and address, address the disease. Regeneron is also working on an antibody cocktail for COVID-19, which appears promising, but we need more data. Moving on to Gilead Science and their uh, drug Remdesivir. We think Remdesivir is not a long-term asset for the company, especially considering Gilead Sciences size. We think the demand for Remdesivir will quickly fall off, especially once the COVID-19 vaccine will be available and broadly distributed and other treatments will be available too. We think remdesivir uses are limited to serious symptoms and its beneficial effects are not necessarily a game changer. Next slide, please. We think there's an enormous challenge, both in terms of research and development and in manufacturing the COVID-19 vaccine. To address that, there's an enormous industry-wide collaboration taking place, which has no previous examples in history. We think safety and efficacy are the main questions that need to be addressed, as this is a fast track project where a vaccine candidate is expected to come to market within 12 to 18 months. This will probably be the fastest developed vaccine in history by far. Usually it takes at least five to 10 years and on average nine years from phase one to approval to develop a vaccine. 
Just to give some context, the fastest vaccine developed so far was the mumps vaccine developed by Merck, and that was in four years between 2063 and uh, 19,000 um, and between 63 and 67. Yet, since then, there has been considerable advances in science and technology, and we think researchers have new tools. The U.S. government's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Fauci, is cautiously optimistic and thinks that the COVID-19 vaccine will be ready late 2020, early 2021. Also, Dr. Fauci states that Within a reasonable period of time, the plan now allows for any American who needs a vaccine to get it within the year 2021. However, we think so vaccine supply chains are extremely complex and there are distribution risks involved. Vaccines require refrigeration and can quickly perish within a couple of days if they are not stored properly. Also, the administration of multiple doses might be problematic. There are also problems related to API, active pharmaceutical ingredients procurement from China and India, especially considering the breadth and spread of the pandemic currently, particularly in India. Next slide, please. So we think the main manufacturing challenge once the vaccine candidate is approved is to make sufficient doses available as quickly as possible. Pharmaceutical companies are investing in additional capabilities or collaborating with others to be able to address the massive demands. We want to address the issue about vaccine efficiency. According to the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, a COVID-19 vaccine with an efficiency between 60% to 80% is needed before social distancing measures are relaxed. And just to give you an example, the flu vaccine's effectiveness ranges from 40 to 60 percent. So when we take this into perspective, at least 75 percent of the population needs to be vaccinated, assuming a 70 percent vaccine efficiency. That means of the 100 people who are getting a vaccine, 70 percent should show immunity against the virus. Considering the U.S. population, which is 330 million, that means roughly 250 to 260 million need to be vaccinated. We think the large scale manufacturing effort at an unprecedented speed is a very complicated process, particularly in the middle of a pandemic. Next slide, please. However, companies express confidence that they are going to be ready to quickly meet the challenge. Johnson & Johnson, is working on manufacturing capabilities and thinks they will be able to deliver more than 1 billion doses of the COVID-19 vaccine by the end of 2021. Pfizer, thanks to the collaboration with BioNTech, plans to manufacture globally up to 100 million doses by the end of 2020 and approximately 1.3 billion doses by the end of 2021. Merck has a different strategy. Uh, they don't necessarily want to be the first one to come to the market, but a, they aim to come with the safest option and a single dose option. So they aim to be in the market during 2021. Next slide, please. We also think that healthcare distributors are well positioned to benefit from large scale distribution efforts. The two largest players, McKesson Corporation, and Amherst or Spurgeon, for which we have a strong buy recommendations and five-star ratings, are set to benefit the most from the distribution of vaccines and treatments against COVID-19. McKesson has an extensive footprint in distribution of vaccines. The company has been involved in the children's vaccine program for many years and has the know-how. ABC has considerable deep supply chain capabilities which it plans to use for the distribution effort in, in the US. Also, both companies have been distribution, distributing drugs on a massive scale. Next slide, please. On a short tangent, in any other election year, the 2020 elections would certainly be the most influential factor affecting investor sentiment towards the biopharmaceutical industry. However, this year we have the COVID-19 pandemic. Our outlook on this is that divided government is likely the best outcome for the biopharmaceutical industry. 
And by divided government, we mean when the executive branch and the legislative branch are split between two parties, as it is right now. We think that a divided government, as it is right now, is the best because even though drug pricing is a bipartisan issue, the two parties have, the Republicans and Democrats, typically have had conflicting approach, approaches to addressing the issue, as can be seen in the bills currently, one in the Senate and one in the House, which are quite different. As a result, we don't expect a mixed government to accomplish much when it comes to lowering the cost of drugs for Americans. We think that a democratic sweep, on the other hand, is the worst case scenario for the biopharmaceutical industry because Democrats have generally been strongly supportive of enacting tough measures to address drug costs, one of the biggest ones being uh, allowing the government to engage in drug price negotiation. And in the middle is Republican sweep. During the 2016 to 2018 period, the government was Republican aligned, but no significant actions were taken to lower drug costs, suggesting that Republicans may not be that interested in doing so. But we do see more impetus for it now than a couple of years ago. Next slide. So what are the best ideas uh, within pharmaceuticals? We think the companies focused on innovations will fare better going forward. And we think particularly those four companies are well placed to benefit from the COVID-19 vaccine and treatment efforts. So we recommend Merck for which we have a strong buy and five stars rating. Uh, we think Merck has a strong positive long-term outlook with no key brands losing marketing exclusivity until 2022. Merck's growth engine Keytruda is on patent until 2028. And the company has two promising COVID-19 vaccine candidates and is also working on a number of antiviral treatments, which, has, which are progressing successfully. Another uh, stock we recommend is Johnson & Johnson. Uh, we have a positive view on Johnson & Johnson's long-term growth prospects. We think the core pharma segment is resilient, which represents 60% of total sales due to the strong immunology and oncology portfolio. In addition, we think Johnson & Johnson has a very solid balance sheet with low debts. Net debt to EBITDA is at 0.4 times as of June 30th, 2020. Also, Johnson & Johnson has been working on a COVID-19 vaccine, which it expects to have available by the first quarter of 2021. Moving on to Pfizer, we have a buy recommendation of Pfizer with four-star ratings. Following the Upjohn spin-off, which is expected to take place in the fourth quarter of this year, we think Pfizer will be in a better position to grow as it will get rid of a declining business. Also, we think the promising mRNA-based vaccine jointly developed by BioNTech will be one of the first ones to come to market. Moving on to Eli Lilly, we have a buy recommendation on Eli Lilly with four stars rating. We think uh, Eli Lilly has a strong focus on innovation, and it has several promising studies on potential COVID-19 therapies that we expect to provide successful results. Next slide, please. Switching gears, let's now talk about elective procedure volumes. Next slide. Elective, procedure vol elective, elective procedures are medical procedures that are scheduled in advance, in other words, non-emergency procedures. They accounted for 37% of hospital admission spending in large employer plans in recent years. So they're quite important to the healthcare sector. Two of the industries that we're going to talk more about that are strongly affected by procedure volumes are medical device companies, because a lot of medical devices are used in medical uh, procedures. And it's also related to health insurer costs, because health insurers spend a lot on paying for procedures to get done. The initial decline uh, of elective procedure volumes was rapid and steep in April because of stay-at-home mandates and overwhelmed healthcare facilities. We highlight in the chart on the right uh, surgery case volumes for two of the largest publicly traded healthcare facility operators, HCA Health Corp and Tenant Healthcare. In the second column, we can see outpatient surgery cases in, at HCA declined 6% in Q1 and then by a staggering 33% in Q2. And surprisingly, emergency room visits also declined 33% in Q2, suggesting that many emergency room visits were not as emergent as believed to be. And then surgical cases at Tenet Healthcare declined even worse by 42%. Next slide. We have we've highlighted several 
quotes from companies that have a good overview of elective procedures here. And generally, most of them pointed to a quick rebound or very rapid rebound in procedure volumes to about 85 to 90 percent of pre-pandemic levels by June and July. Intuitive Surgical is a leading manufacturer of robotic surgery systems, and they pointed to a return to above 90 percent of pre-COVID levels. We also highlighted quotes from the two largest healthcare companies in the U.S., United Health Group and Johnson & Johnson, and they said similar things. Next slide. We believe that one of the main factors driving this is because even though many people deferred medical care because of the pandemic, they were still willing to get the medical care they needed. According to polling by Kaiser Family Foundation in mid-June, over half of respondents in the U.S. said that they or a family member deferred medical care. However, of the, that 52%, only 5% said that they had no plans to re reschedule the care that they had previously deferred. And 77% said that they had already gotten it or that they were planning to get it within the next three months. So this bodes well for recovery. Next slide. So what have companies said about the outlook? Generally, we think that companies have a positive view, but with uh, a little more mixed view towards the recovery towards the end. Say we're at 90 to 95% of procedure pre-COVID procedure levels, it's gonna be a, a, long, a bit longer to get from 95 to 100, we think, or even be beyond that. For example, Intuitive Surgical said that the recovery tail of surgery will be a long one, likely to last many quarters. Although there is some positive news. Stryker Corporation, for example, said that because of the chronic and progressive nature of the conditions impacting its patients, that the vast majority of them will be treated in the coming months. Next slide. Overall, our outlook is that the recent recovery in procedures is durable and that future resurgences should be manageable and not significantly impact volumes. We have several reasons for believing this. One of the first ones is many health conditions get worse over time. Conditions such as heart disease or osteoarthritis become much more burdensome over time without intervention. And we're sure that physicians and healthcare facility operators are encouraging patients to get their surgeries uh, to reduce future health risks. Another reason is that healthcare facility operators are highly motivated. As you mentioned earlier, these operators, they generate a lot of their revenue and profitability from elective procedures. So we've heard from earnings calls and from other companies that many facility operators have taken measures to boost surgical capacity and also increase preparedness for future resurgences in COVID-19 cases. And one of the last main reasons that we think we, we have a positive outlook on the elective procedure recovery is that patients are confident. Based on that polling we sh showed earlier and also recent trends, it suggests that patients are comfortable scheduling their appointments and getting the care they need. Originally, there was fear from uh, analysts and investors that patients might not want to go to the hospital because of increased risk of contracting COVID. On top of that, vaccine in the treatment development appears promising, which should help us get back to normal uh, sooner rather than later. Next slide. On this slide, we highlight some of the positive catalysts and the negative catalysts for the recovery and elective procedures. The positive catalysts are pretty obvious. A quick vaccine approval, something by before 2020 end, a quick and efficient vaccine rollout would also be very beneficial. Uh, also increased incentives from the government. We believe that the government is planning on making vaccines free and encouraging it. That should definitely help with returning to normal. And on the negative side, we see the flip side for some of these things, such as if we see safety concerns with vaccines, or if there's a slow rollout of the va vaccine campaign. One of our biggest concerns is a fall or winter case resurgence because at that time there are certainly higher risks, uh, especially with the flu season. Next slide. In this slide, we highlight three different scenarios that we see for elective procedure volumes. On the right side, on the charts, we highlight uh, procedure volumes as a percentage of pre-pandemic levels. In the middle, we have our base case, which we assume that the recent resurgence, the one that started in roughly late June and, and is starting to come down in mid-August, mid we think that resurgence of COVID-19 cases will overwhelm some hospitals in some locations. But overall, we think that most hospitals won't be nearly as devastated as they were in the early stages of the pandemic. We also think that future resurgences will be better managed 
due to improving practices on how to manage COVID-19 cases and also surge capacity, and also a wider avail availability of therapeutics. As we saw, as so mentioned earlier, there are a lot being developed right now. This translates to the elective procedure chart as you see here. We, we expect a slight dip in procedure volume levels in July once the data comes out, and then we expect it to trend up pretty quickly. But it's going to be hard to get back to 100%, we think, in the near future. We think that the pessimistic case is looking less likely given how well hospitals have been managing uh, surge capacity and it's possible that we could get to a more optimistic case so that might depend on how comfortable how comfortable with consumers are with on spending next slide now let's move into how these elective our elective procedure outlook affects our outlook for the medical device industry next slide in Q3, we expect sales to decline slightly, and in Q4, we expect sales to return to year-over-year year, year growth of about 6%. This is in line with what, what most companies are saying, and we think that many. one thing to note that is it can vary for companies a lot because some companies are benefiting from short-term tailwinds, such as a backlog of deferred procedures, while others are benefiting from new COVID-19-related revenue sources such as COVID-19 testing, that's benefiting a lot of diagnostics firms. One of the things that's harder to determine is what's the new normal? That's going to have a larger impact on our long-term long outlook. And one of the things that we think is going to affect elective procedure volumes and medical device sales in the future is weak economic conditions and elevated US employment. Next slide. However, our long-term outlook is still pretty strong. In this chart here, we've gather data from Valiant Pharma, a provider of uh, medical device data, and they're forecasting that sales growth after starting from 2022 should be above pre-pandemic levels at about five to six percent. And we think that's pretty reasonable given long-term trends that are benefiting uh, the healthcare industry and particularly medical devices, one of them being global aging. Populations are generally having higher aged people on average, on top of that, generally countries are also spending more and more on healthcare, especially in emerging economies. Next slide. As we mentioned earlier, there have been opportunities arising from the pandemic for some healthcare equipment companies. One of the first ones being diagnostics for COVID-19 testing, which falls primarily into two categories. The first one being viral tests for current infection, and the second being antibody tests for past infection. We think that demand for these tests will likely fall off pretty quickly after vaccines are broadly available. But even then, we think that there will be constant demand for testing because we don't think COVID-19 is going away fully anytime soon. This benefits companies such as Abbott, Becton Dick Dickinson and & Company, and Hologic. Life sciences and supplies companies have also benefited a lot from the pandemic because they've been providing supplies and equipment to research, manufacture, and distribute COVID-19 therapies. Equipment demand surge is likely to be temporary, but we think that demand for supplies could be much more lasting. This would benefit companies such as Becton Dickinson and Company, one of the largest suppliers in the world of needles and syringes, Donaher, which does a lot of bioprocessing, and West Pharmaceutical Services, which also does packaging for uh, drug delivery devices. And then the other benefit that we've seen is temporary FDA use. The FDA has granted numerous medtech products emergency use authorization, or EUA, for COVID-19 treatment. For example, Abiomed has done very well in the stock market recently because its minimally invasive heart pumps were granted EUAs. Over half of the large medtech names have received an EUA for at least one product, though. So an EUA in, in and of itself does not indicate whether or not a company is going to be able to overcome the headwinds of COVID. Next slide. We think that med tech industry currently though appears quite expensive relative to historical levels. In this chart in the blue line, we highlight the median next 12 month price to earnings ratio for 10 of the largest medical device firms. And it's generally been trending up and reached a near all time high in early 2019, and it's been around, it was there, roughly there prior to the pandemic, 25 times earnings. And as of two weeks ago, forward earnings relative to 2021 earnings, because 
2020 earnings, next 12 month earnings are a little more uh, jumbled because of COVID's impact, is at 27 times, suggesting that a lot of these companies' valuations are quite high, and we're not sure that the pandemic's upsides have fully offset the downsides for most companies. Next slide. In this chart, we show that more that there is a wide distribution of share price performance among the medical device companies. At the top end, we show companies that are poor performers, and the bottom, we show the best performers. As mentioned earlier, Abiomed, it got an EUA for its product, and it primarily sells heart pumps. So that's quite benefited investor sentiment towards the company. One thing you'll notice is that in the, in the third column, referring to surgical procedure volumes, companies with exposure to surgical procedures perform much worse than those that don't have much exposure to surgical procedures. Especially, and the companies that had exposure to particularly elective procedures, such as orthopedics procedures, perform the worst, such as Stryker and Zimmer Biomet. You also notice that diagnostics firms, such as Hologic, Donaher, and Abbott, they fared better than their comparable pair, peers because of COVID-19 test sales. Another thing that we've noticed is that companies with higher levels of debt also generally fared worse in the stock market. Next slide. So given all this diversity in performance, and given all the volatility, the, the weak economy and the pandemic, uh, we have some ideas for what names might be best to invest in. One of our top ones is Medtronic which we have a five stars rating on. It's a diversified med tech firm that we think is well positioned to capture market share and serve a socially distanced health conscious world. They have one of the strongest balance sheets among companies of their size and they're going aggressively after capturing market share through both m and internal opportunities. Edwards Life Sciences, which we have a four stars rating on, is a peer play manufacturer of heart therapies. And we don't see heart valve therapies declining in in levels anytime soon. So we think that they'll be able to maintain their share price in the near future, even if there's volatility. On top of that, the company has robust cash flows and a net cash position. Boston Scientific, which we have a four stars rating on, is another diversified med tech firm. And we think that its rating has been beaten down significantly because of its high debt leverage. But we think that given its recent actions to increase liquidity, and also its promising portfolio of new products to treat many urgent medical conditions, that it's well positioned to outperform its peers. And last but not least, Abbott Laboratories, for, which we have a four stars rating on, is a diverse, another diversified med tech firm. It's also a div dividend aristocrat with exposure to COVID-19 diagnostics, which we think there is upside to, and also the rapidly expanding diabetes market. Next slide. So we'll now move to the managed care industry and our outlook for the second half of the year. Next slide, please. So what are our expectations for the future of managed healthcare industry's profitability? In the first half of the year, the managed healthcare companies benefited considerably from deferred electives. The medical loss ratio, which is the proportion of premiums to medical claims, of managed care companies hit historic lows, uh, especially in the second quarter of the year. We had a medical loss ratios around 70% uh, compared to 80 to 85% in Q2 2019. Also, compared to the same period last year, the utilization of medical services was on average 35% lower in April and 25% lower in May. So this enabled managed care companies to manage the adverse impact of COVID-19 and also offset COVID-19 related costs in the first half of the year. Since stay at home orders were lifted and deferred procedures started to pick up, uh, we also saw medical utilization levels returning to more normal levels, pretty much trending close to last year's level. At the same time, we are seeing COVID-19 related treatment costs rising as more and more people are getting affected. Therefore, we do not expect this trend in medical loss ratios to continue. Uh, and we think the full recovery is not going to be achieved until 2021, especially as we see the resurgence of new cases in July. Next slide, please. 
So when we look at managed healthcare companies, we see both opportunities and risks. We think uh, the main risk is the membership losses in the commercial segment, particularly in the second half of the year due to the rise in unemployment and also the shift of enrollment mix towards Medicaid and individual products. We also think that there's a large risk related to, to uh, sharper than expected recovery in medical procedures as those could only be delayed up to a certain time and higher than anticipated COVID-19 related costs, especially if there's a second wave of COVID-19 infections. Next slide, please. So what are our best ideas for managed care companies? We give you here our top four recommendations. We think those companies should perform well through volatility and the pandemic. Uh, we recommend Humana, for which we have a buy recommendation and four stars rating. Humana has a big focus on private Medicare plans, which is 80% of its revenue. And because of the rising demand for Medicare Advantage plans, we think the company is well positioned. Another company we recommend and for which we have a strong, we have a buy recommendation is Centene, for which we have a four stars rating. Uh, we think Centene benefits from an environment favorable for Medicaid insurers. It is right now by far the largest Medicaid insurer in terms of membership following the WellCare acquisition completed in 2020. We think uh, this acquisition has vast potential. We also recommend Cigna, for which we have a buy recommendation and four stars rating. We think uh, Cigna is very well positioned for long-term gro growth. It is a solid business and following the acquisition of Express Scripts, we expect cost synergies going forward. We think the acquisition of Express Scripts creates one of the largest providers of pharmacy benefit managers and insurance plans. Last but not least, moving on to Molina Healthcare, for which we also have a buy recommendation and four stars rating. We think uh, Molina is also well positioned because its primary business is Medicaid. And it also works with states through contracted managed care plans. Moreover, the company recently acquired Magellan Healthcare, which is a managed care organization operating in six states. And we think this will be a key growth driver going forward. Next slide, please. Well, thanks, Sal and Kevin, uh, for really terrific insights on the industry and COVID-19. Uh, coming up on the hour, we want to do rapid fire questions. Um, and also, if you do have questions, you can send them to the organizer via chat. First one, Kevin, um, there hasn't really been a lot vetted in the media about a winter resurgence. So how likely do you think this could occur and, and the impact on uh, the companies that you cover? Thanks, Ken. Uh, we don't see a strong resurgence as the most likely outcome, but we think it's a very plausible outcome. When the, the fall winter timeframe presents several key risks. The first one being that it's the flu season, which increases risk of COVID-19 spread through sneezing and coughing. The second is that cold weather generally weakens immune systems. And the third is that a holiday season encourages more gatherings, and we think that could also lead to more spreading of COVID-19. And this would certainly be a negative for uh, medical device companies if we see a strong case resurgence, but we're hoping that people will be able to maintain their social distancing and proper practices, and also that healthcare facilities are able to handle any sort of surge. Oh, great, and so uh, there was a great chart showing Moderna's rise of price performance, but the pharma stocks have not. Um, when would one blockbuster vaccine rolling out with the magnitude of a billion dollar deal, do you think they will all rise or, or you really wanna focus on one or two on the upside? <laughs> sure, <laughs> thanks uh, for the question, Ken. Maybe we can reproject slide 16. Um, so uh, I agree, I mean, Moderna was essentially a very small company focusing on mRNA-based treatments and vaccines, and it didn't have 
uh, I would say, the large scale portfolio and the diversity of other companies. So essentially, that's why the, the vaccine was definitely a huge driver. For uh, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer and Merck, there were definitely other uh, dynamics going on because they have a uh, considerable uh, portfolio in oncology and immunology which are like really driving uh, areas. Um, so I think, you know, definitely the 12 to 18 months time frame uh, seems realistic uh, and everything is moving very, very fast. Uh, I think, you know, essentially Moderna and Pfizer are very close. Um, essentially, definitely we will see the price repercussion uh, for those, for the, for the company involved. But I think, uh, there's this question about efficiency and safety. For example, Merck uh, believes that it's not important to be the first comer to the market. Uh, it's important to come with a single dose vaccine and a safe vaccine. So they essentially target a high level of uh, effectiveness, probably about 70 to 80%. So it's clearly important to be the first one to come to market, but it's also very important which company will come up to the market with the safest uh, vaccine. So I think uh, definitely there's a long uh, period where we'll be watching um, how stock prices will evolve. And I think definitely the story doesn't end once we have the first COVID-19 vaccine. Great. Uh, Kevin, this is in your wheelhouse on medtech companies. Great question from the field. Companies in this group with higher levels of jet jet generally, and that's debt, fared worse in the stock market. Uh, what specific debt measurements does CFRA use for comparison and what levels do uh, you consider excessive or acceptable for this sector or individual companies? So in, my, in our analysis, we often look at debt leverage, which is uh, particularly net debt to trailing 12 month EBITDA, although in case of COVID-19, that's skewed it a lot. Um, so we look at that on a regular run rate and how quickly that recovers in the case of the pandemic. We also like to look at net debt relative to total capital. And usually when leverage ratio, the first one I mentioned, looks a little high, one of the things I like to do is then get more into the specifics of maturities on debt, looking at if there's any upcoming large payments and whether or not the company can sufficiently address that. And so far, I've ran a screen on pretty much all of the companies in our coverage, and it looks like most of them will be fine uh, through the pandemic, even if there is a resurgence in cases significantly impacting uh, revenues and earnings. Okay, great. And then for both of you, let's sort through this question. Uh, do you see increased unemployment leading to increased enrollment in Medicaid, which would benefit Molina uh, and other servicing Medicaid users increasing their stock values? Any thoughts there? Um, so, um, just going back to uh, Molina, maybe, uh, definitely, so Molina's uh, you know, main uh, focus is Medicaid managed care, and it's very related to unemployment levels right now. So uh, definitely there's a direct correlation as unemployment is rising, definitely the companies more exposed to med Medicaid uh, plans are set to benefit. So Molina is one of them. And uh, in that perspective, I think there's a, there's a good outlook. Um, I think definitely going forward, uh, the trend is for the unemployment to rise or at least uh, stabilize at these levels. But um, I don't think there's going to be a significant downtrend in unemployment, at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, so, so Kevin, here's a hip and knee surgery question. Uh, hearing that orthopedic procedures <clears throat> Are they being rescheduled or, or canceled? And uh, is there any concern here uh, in tracking the orthopedic manufacturers on, on the pace looking ahead? Uh, Cassie, could you pull up slide 38? We, we've seen the, the share price performance of a lot of orthopedic med tech firms uh, much, fare much worse than their med tech pairs. At the very top here with Stryker and Zimmer Biomet, tickers SYK and ZBH. They're two of the largest orthopedics firms in the world. And 
it's re it's been reflective the steep decline in April to procedure volumes. There was roughly an 80% decline in orthopedic procedures. However, we've seen it rebound very quickly because many of these pa uh, patients have chronic and progressive conditions such as osteoarthritis that become worse over time. And it should be important for people to get these procedures done earlier rather than later. We think that equipment sales uh, for orthopedic systems could weaken, but uh, government stimulus has provided bridge funding to healthcare facility operators. And then we expect patient willingness to support the continued recovery and strength in orthopedic procedures. Great. Uh, and so last question for you from the field. How is an mRNA vaccine likely to be priced relative to a more traditional non-replicating viral vac vector vaccine? Um, so actually, Kevin covers Moderna, but I would like to go back uh, to slide uh, maybe 15 and elaborate a little bit more about uh, the pricing issue. Um, so based on the government, the U.S. government agreement with uh, Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer, um, this priced actually the mRNA-based vaccine higher compared to a traditional vaccine, which I think uh, is, a, is an interesting angle, uh, mainly because I'm I think it was priced higher because it was the first agreement. But as Kevin mentioned, um, normally uh, the mRNA-based vaccines should be uh, manufactured uh, at a lower cost compared to traditional vaccines. Essentially, it's a synthetic material and it's easier to replicate it and uh, produce on a massive scale. So when we think about that, uh, definitely compared to uh, traditional vaccines, uh, mRNA based vaccines should have a lower cost. But when we look at the U.S. government's agreement uh, and the pricing coming from the agreement, this is not what we are seeing initially, but things might change. Maybe Kevin has additional uh, views related to Moderna. Yeah, to add to that, I think one of the reasons they're able to price a little higher is because they're newer technologies. Maybe down the line in 10 years, they'll be priced way below uh, standard approach to developing vaccines, but mRNA vaccines have never been approved before, so a lot has been spent into researching and developing these. And Moderna is able to price a little higher because this company has been around for over 10 years and hasn't uh, made any revenue off uh, selling drugs, so they kind of need to price it slightly higher, although it's still way below, I think, the value that uh, it, it offers. I, I do want to, this last question, 30 seconds on Stryker. What is our views? Striker, we think are generally positive. I think that it's a little undervalued right now relative to its medical device peers because we think that procedure volumes will recover pretty strongly. And also we think that currently with the bridge financing, uh, essentially for healthcare facilities from government stimulus, that there will be continued purchases of their robotic systems. Although we do think that is certainly one of the larger risks if the economic environment looks bad those purchases could go down significantly. Great. Cassie, last slide, please. I want to thank everyone for joining us from your busy schedules. And uh, we also want to share with you in our series, The Road to Recovery, uh, that the next upcoming sessions are September 9th, Invest in American Infrastructure, September 23, Real Estate Road to Recovery from the Abyss. And certainly, if you have questions, or interest in getting more of the research from Kevin and Sel today on healthcare, um, you can certainly reach out to us and, and certainly on the webinars. Um, for Market Scope Advisor, uh, certainly the research presented today will be posted. I want to thank everyone for joining us, and uh, uh, this has been a, a fabulous session talking about. Uh, COVID-19 impact on all our lives. Uh, be safe and healthy out there. Thank you again.